uh, as we go along for these next few minutes, uh, I want to bring some uh, context to that. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19 in the uh, NIV version, it says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of Hades, if you read in the King James, it would say the gates of hell. The gates of Hades, the NIV says, Hades will not prevail or overcome it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Uh, we are so blessed. Uh, we've been, I uh, feel like, on a whirlwind tour. Uh, Lady and I, two weeks ago, uh, after church, we jetted off to Richmond, Virginia, uh, to be in worship with my mom, celebrating her pre Anna pre birthday celebration. Uh, after that, the next week we were uh, here, uh, we were, excuse me, in Buffalo last week, New York. We flew out on Friday, there Friday uh, through Sunday. And then this week, uh, Thursday, we started our uh, fellowship to be with uh, our brother, uh, Bishop Gerald Silver and the Freedom Assembly churches uh, in their Freedom Assembly. Uh, which is a part of us because uh, we are a family and uh, we've been uh, a part of that Freedom Assembly, uh, just supporting them and sharing with them for the last probably 12 years. Uh, I don't think we've missed a year yet, uh, other than the pandemic year that they didn't have the assembly. Uh, so uh, it was a blessing to be with them. Uh, uh, next week, my mom celebrates her uh, birthday, uh, which uh, we will probably not, not be able to make that one because of scheduling. Uh, and then after that, we're scheduled to be in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, with Bishop Gail uh, LeGrand Williams for uh, what is her women's retreat, which I don't have a part to play. Uh, Lady uh, Reverend Gail will probably be more uh, active, uh, but I'm I invited to be a part of the oversight or the support of that. And uh, so we've got, we've been uh, in a whirlwind. So this weekend, it was exciting because uh, again, we got to be with saints from all over uh, in support of Freedom Assembly where their uh, conference theme was uh, the necessities uh, that sustain the church, the necessities that sustain the church. And so many people talked about that, those necessities that sustain the church. And uh, I was just so blessed by that. And usually on the Sundays we come back from there, I'm always kind of on the overflow, in the overflow uh, from those messages that we will have been uh, privy to King the messages and revelation, and, and I love it because so uh, much of it connects with where we are uh, in this day and in this time, Amen. where it feels and seems like we are being bombarded on so many levels, where we are perplexed, where we are seemingly, some seem destroyed, uh, but we're not forsaken Amen. because God is with us. And so even as we think about those necessities that sustain the church, it's always uh, interesting to see what the fallout is for me. What are the overflows, the things that God gives me concerning those same thoughts that we will have experienced? Like last week, I gave thoughts from the overflow of even when we were in Richmond and sharing Amos 9 
how God is going to uh, allow the blessings to overtake us. And I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Amos 9, 13, and what God has said, and it shall be in the Message Bible. We read that last week. I'm still on that. And this week, uh, just flowing out of uh, the necessities that sustain the church. What are those things that we need? Somebody said, those things that we need, those things that we need to sustain the church. It is vitally important to understand what those things are. Somebody said what they are. Hallelujah. So when we think about what those things are, it is important to be aware. And so when we look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, it is where Jesus tells Peter that upon this rock, this rock, this understanding, he says, you are Peter, you are Petros, little rock, uh, and upon this rock I build my church. Somebody said God's church. He says, and the gates of hell, that tells me that even a pandemic cannot affect, cannot a, a, a go against will not overcome the church. Doesn't mean we won't be in a fight. That's right, that's right. But it just means we won't be overcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Bible says shall not prevail against it. Many times we find ourselves in the fight of our lives. Somebody shout, but I win. But I, win. I win every time. Every time. Every time there's a song, some quiet happy has. And I remember the end of the vamp of the song. It just says, we always win. How do I know we always win? Because for 30 years now, I have proclaimed Isaiah 54, 17 out of, over my life that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rise against me in judgment, I will condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. I that have gone by in 30 years. That's 52 times 30. There hasn't been a week that has gone by that I have not quoted that scripture over my life for the last 30 years. And so I understand that weapons will be formed, but they won't prosper. Hallelujah. They will be formed, but they won't prosper. Hallelujah. Even as we prayed for Sister Army, uh, uh, weapons were formed, and God knows she sustained even three hits, but she's alive to talk about it. Yes. Hallelujah. Not saying anything against those who have perished where they've been hit because we recognize and we humbly understand that there is a power that God has some way to hold us, hold our minds, even when we've been hit and even when seemingly we perish. But I'm here to tell you, even when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we still win for the people of God. Even if we have to succumb to death, it is ultimately for our life. Because we can never die. The Bible says we can never die. As soon as life leaves our body, we are immediately transmitted and transferred into the presence of the Lord. We never, we can never die. Believers can never die. My daddy used to sing a song years ago, saints don't die. They just sleep away. Saints don't die, they just sleep away. I've been able to witness death on so many levels to see my father on a Sunday morning. I know I talk about it way too much. I see him uh, collapse in the pulpit on a Sunday like this and literally die in church service while seeing the song somebody prayed for me had me on their mind and he dropped and collapsed and immediately is translated into the presence of God. I witnessed that and that changes your life. I witnessed having to uh, bury my little grandbaby uh, uh, just at a few uh, years old, having to uh, bury your grandbaby and having to uh, bury and preach the funeral of your son. So it don't mean death won't happen. It don't mean we won't experience it. Uh, a lady and, and we remember her father on a Friday night 
experiencing almost the same thing coming out of a service uh, just like this. We've seen it happen. We witnessed it. But we know that what happens is the fact that for every believer, we don't just die. We are moved and we are passed on into the presence of God. Somebody say the presence of God. It is this kind of knowledge. Somebody said this kind of knowledge that God, through Jesus Christ, builds the church. He tells Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You said, well, my God, where did all of that come from? Where do we get that? Let me just give you a little background. As Jesus is declaring, even in verse 13, we read verse 18. 13 says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say? that the Son of Man is. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked Peter. What about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, he said, he answered, Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Somebody say the Messiah. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, a uh, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by, somebody say, but by my father in heaven. And that's where we end up at verse 18. And he says, because you know who I am by revelation and by the spirit, he says, upon this rock, somebody say this rock. So what is the rock? That rock is knowledge of God. The knowledge because Peter, after everybody said, you are, you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. Uh, uh, who Many of them were saying who the world says Jesus is. And he asked Peter, but Peter said, but thou art the Christ. You are the Christ, but thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ means Messiah. Uh, uh, the King James says the Christ. The NIV says the Messiah. Peter knows who God is in Jesus Christ. Here's my message, and here's the crux of the matter. It is not as much important what I think of you. It is just as important or more so what you think of me. It was not important what the world says about Jesus. It's important what we know about Jesus. What we know about God is more important than what the world says. Why? Because the church, I believe these are the necessity that sustains the church. What sustains the church is our true knowledge of God. Somebody say, our true knowledge of God. Our true knowledge. How do I know? Philippians 3, 8 says, I doubt, uh, yeah, Paul says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I count everything but loss. More important is that I understand my knowledge of Jesus Christ. Somebody says, it's not about what God thinks of me. It's about what I think about God. It is about what I know about God because God's knowledge of us uh, supersedes who we are. God knew us before we knew ourselves. God knew us before, the Bible says, before the foundation of the world. God says, before you were consumed or conceived, excuse me, in your mother's womb, I knew you. So God has already known us. But the problem is many of us don't know God. Somebody say, I got to know him. It is important that we know him. It's one thing to know God, but it's another thing for God also to know us. Does God know us? Why do we know that that's important? Let me just tell you why it's important that God knows us. Let me go back. We need to know God, number one, and God needs to know us. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. It says, not everyone, this is why it's important that God knows us. 
Somebody said, that's what God needs to, God needs to have this knowledge that God knows us as the church. This is a necessity. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does what? The will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, come on, preachers, in your name, and in your name drive out demons, all the prayer warriors, and in your name, somebody say, in his name, perform many miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. He says, away from me, you evil doers. That's why I say it's as important now that God knows us. Because he tells us, because there will be many who have done even in their giftedness, have done many evil works. All the prophets that's prophesied because gifts and callings are without repentance. God is not going to repent and say, I wish I had never given you that gift. I wish I had never given you that. that I will. No, God is not going to repent. But what's going to happen is the day we stand before the Lord. If after all of that prophesying, if after all of that miracle working, we still are evil in our hearts. He's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. That's why it's, it's important that God knows us. Somebody say, God knows us. That's why it's important that we as the church, and there's a difference. God was saying to me as I was just walking this morning and, and just moving and, and getting things ready for service, God began to just speak to me. And saying, as the church, while there are so many falling away, I heard it being talked about even last night uh, with Pastor DiCarlo. Many have fallen away. He talked about the nuns and the duns. There's a new phenomenon uh, in the world where there are the nuns, the N O N E S S, the nuns, those who were brought up in the church. Mama loved God. Grandma loved God. Grandma prayed for him. Mama prayed for him. Kept them on the bench, on the road. They sang in the choir. They were in the, the top choir. They were in the youth choir. They were in the young adult choir. And after a while, even many throughout the cycle of the pandemic between 2019 and 2021 made a decision that they were going to become the nuns. Meaning, I don't need this anymore. You can have the church. I'm walking away from the church. And this is what they say. But I still love God. I, I, I still love God. I just can't do church anymore. I, I, I love God because I can experience God anywhere. And I'm in agreement. I experience God. Some of my greatest revelations is when I'm walking out, doing my 30 minutes, my, my time out walking. Some of my greatest revelations is sitting on that a, a balcony at the beach, at, at Myrtle Beach uh, in the morning when, when that sunrise is coming up or when that sun is setting uh, on that water, and uh, Lady and I sitting out on that balcony. Yes, we get revelation, but getting revelation and being in a place where you can sense the presence of God is totally different than being a part of the body of Christ. Oh, did you hear me? There's a difference with experiencing the presence of God. Folks, don't mistake the presence because God's presence is everywhere. Do not mistake the presence from being in the body. And the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones are considered the body of Christ. There's a big difference in being the ecclesia and just being spiritual. And I understand spiritual.
spirituality. I love spiritual thinking and spiritual thought. We are spiritual beings, but there's a difference in that and the next step, which is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Somebody say a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. I, I was thinking about this song that says, uh, it's called In the Garden. It says, I come to the garden alone while the dew, I was thinking about this this morning, walking the dog, our grand dog this morning at 5.30 this morning. She woke me up wanting to go out and I was just like, you know what? But I, as I walk with my with my uh, uh, slippers on out in the grass, the dew got on my feet. And I thought about this song, I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear catch this falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. Here you go. And he tells me that I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever no. Woo! Look at this other verse. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. That's why I say it's a big difference having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and just being spiritual, feeling his presence. Oh, yes, you can feel it in the mountains. Oh, yes, you can feel it on your height. I don't disagree with that. I totally agree. But it's a difference when we know he walks with me. And he talks with me. And here's the cat. He tells me that I am his own. My God, my God. Ooh. Somebody said that's a big difference. So that's why I challenge all of these spiritual thinkers. I challenge you to understand that there's a big difference in what we want to call just spiritual thought. And just be and feel in the present and think you don't need the body of Christ. The fellowship of the saints. There's a big difference. Why? Because we are a part of the body. You can't remove yourself from the body and then claim to still be one with God. To reject the body, to reject the church of God, and I'm not talking about a particular building. I'm talking about the ecclesia. That's why we find fellowship in Raleigh. We find fellowship in Buffalo. We find fellowship in Richmond. We find fellowship in Tyson's Corner. Why? Because we are part of the body. And when we go to these places, even though they're not a part of global harvest, they are part of the greater body. And it's folks with like minds, with like beliefs, with like faith, with like understanding, like what Jesus says. And I tell you this, Peter, that on this understanding, I will build my church, my ecclesia, my called out ones. These are the ones that you got to understand. You don't want to be as I close. I'm looking at my countdown clock. I got a minute and 25 seconds. You don't want to be a part of this group. And, and so this is what I tell, uh, I tell even thinkers that understand this, that folks that are a part of this great, what I understand, Jesus and the word lets us know that in that day there will be a great falling away. So sometimes folks think they're just disconnecting 
and don't realize the greater revelation is not you just you're not disconnected from the church you are part of the great falling away there would be a great falling away it's not about the church oh I, you see we we too busy to equate the church with a pastor with a particular person. And church is bigger than a pastor. Church is a part of the fellowship of the body. There's the church in, in Germany. We got pastors, uh, we got some of our folks in Germany right now that are experiencing a uniting of beliefs and faith. I got several folks that are uh, family members. Uh, my, my nieces, uh, Danielle and Narita uh, Graves are right now living in Germany. Uh, uh, Bishop Donnie Graves' daughter singing and ministering over in Germany, been living there for, for years. Uh, Darnita uh, uh, and uh, Brother Kirk uh, over there in Germany. Uh, church is going on ministry going on building choirs why because the gospel the church of god is bigger than a pastor yeah. you gotta understand just because you ran into a bad pastor that make the church as a whole bad That's right. That's right. hallelujah one bad apple doesn't spoil the whole bunch just because you ran into a bad apple don't mean you the whole bushel is bad. I refuse. Sometimes I get a bushel, a bunch of grapes, and there might be a couple of bad ones in the bunch. And I'll throw the bad ones out, but I don't throw the whole bunch out. Oh, come on, somebody. You got to understand, every now and then, even when you buy food, you might get a couple of bad oranges in the bunch, but you don't throw out the whole bag. Some folks do, and that's what some folks do with the church. We're going to walk away from the church because I just don't like that anymore. I, I think a little different and, and higher now. I realize I don't need the church. Well, when you say you don't need the church, you're saying you don't need the body of Christ. Because the church is the body. They are the body of Christ. And so the bigger picture for me in the necessities that sustain the church is that the church is the necessity all by itself. I need the church, the body of Christ. We got members uh, on here, Durham members, and Charlotte members uh, in Virginia, members uh, in New York. We got members that are, are with us, members in uh, Florida, members in Ohio. And no, they are not here in high points, but they refuse to be disconnected from the body. This is a part, part of their point of contact. We need believers with like minds, like-minded believers. And we're not talking about just believers in nature. We're talking about believers in God. Believers in Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, whichever name, the Greek, the Hebrew, you understand, even the African transliteration, whichever you understand, if it comes back to the Christ mind, the Christ consciousness, the consciousness of God in Christ Jesus, the one with whom we have pledged our allegiance in God. The one who walks with us, talks with us, tells us that we are his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Another hymn just says, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. 
He lives, he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. These are the necessities, the necessities of the church. These are the necessities. The church itself is a necessity. I need the church. Why? Because you are the church. You are the church. You are the church. And I love it how, I don't know if Hezekiah wrote it, but I know he sang it. I need you to survive. I'm afraid of those who go out on their own by themselves. Even if you understand mental health, it is always dangerous when folks isolate. Ooh, Jesus, let me, let me go home. It is dangerous when folks isolate themselves. They tell us all of the time, what are the signs of these folks who commit many of these? They start to isolate themselves. Not just them, but folks who commit suicide. What happened? It's when they cease to communicate with the whole, when they separate themselves from the group and they go out on their own, they isolate themselves. We become dangerous to our own selves. I am not saying everyone who does that becomes a mass murderer or becomes a person who becomes suicidal. But I'm saying it is never a good thing to isolate yourself from the whole, from the body of Christ. As much as you want to think about church and we time too many times we equate the church with a person the church is bigger than one person who stepped on your toe church is bigger than one pastor one preacher who may have abused their power the church is bigger than that there's some folks there's a lot of folks that love you there's a lot of folks that are blessed by you being present that's why church is a blessing. Gathering is a blessing. I love a, a, a your virtual and conference call because we use those. Those are needful and powerful tools. But I need my brothers and sisters. Bishop Silver said several times this week, church was made to be a place of affection. That's why the pandemic caused so many breaches because we need that church hug. We need that, that love. We need that, that high five. We need that, we need that connectedness. And I, I need it. We need it. Again, Hezekiah says, I need you to survive. That's why I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. You are important to me. I need you to survive. The church is the necessity all by itself. The church, what are the necessities that sustain the church? The church sustains the church. What is the church? The church is us. Who is the church? The church is you. Let me say it again. What is the church? The church is us. Who is the church? The church is you. And upon this rock, this knowledge, this conscious awareness of Christ, God builds the church, the ecclesia. And the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. 